Welcome everybody to this webcast. Uh, again, as a reminder, the Q&A function is at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna try to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. That will probably be the most interesting part of the, um, of the event, so please take advantage of that and, and, and start putting in questions as we go. I have a few comments on governance and ESG implications of the crisis uh, before we'll go to Guion for uh, capital market and economic comments. Um, at Mercer, we share in the shock, the horror, the sadness, the anger that our clients generally share in, in looking at Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine and the humanitarian consequences of that. The millions of refugees, the recent re revelations of mass killings of civilians, and and just the the tragedy of of war that's brought to our to our desktops every day through through social media and formal media and so on. And as our clients think about this and engage in this from a governance perspective in regards to their investment programs, it's important to recognize that our clients are human beings and they're bringing those emotions the shock, the horror, the anger, the sadness, the disbelief into the decision-making room with them. And then our clients as fiduciaries get down to thinking about, well, what does this mean for our investment program? What do we do in regards to our decision-making as fiduciaries for other people's money? And the concerns quickly go to impact on the macro economy, and Guion's gonna talk about that in a minute, but also to divestment and exclusion of Russian securities. And in many cases, our clients are turning back to their environmental, social, and corporate governance policies, their ESG policy documents for guidance as to what to do in regards to Russian securities. But for the most part, globally, those documents have been put together thinking about individual securities. The prospect of an entire country engaging in rogue behavior and becoming a prior nation getting summarily kicked out of major benchmark indices, having mass divestment, basically no liquidity and securities, wasn't contemplated for the most part in writing ESG policies. Or if it was, it goes way back to South Africa free days or to much smaller economies and markets than Russia, such as Iran and Sudan at various points of time in, in some countries. So some ESG policies have proved very helpful where they talk about public good, human good, human rights, um, and, and clients have been able to quickly take decisions about divestment and exclusion, other policies less helpful. Um, at the same time as our clients are bringing emotions into the room and having a strong desire to express their, their disgust with Russian actions by through divestment, through exclusion, as fiduciaries, they're also needing to consider relative value. And we've observed major differences by region in how much weight is given to relative value. The idea that maybe some of these securities will have more value if held for a period of time than they would have sold today. That varies by region, that varies by client. It, it, it's in our view a legitimate concern to bring into decision making, but this is, this is an area where emotions run high. And, and so the decision taking has been complicated. And again, in some cases, the SG policies are less clear than might have been desirable. So switching from the short-term reaction around divestment exclusion to longer-term implications for governance, what we see clients doing is revisiting their ESG policies so that if, if this happens in future, um, they'll have more clear guidance and, and better, a better shared understanding of their stakeholders with their stakeholders of what should be done. In those discussions, other countries are put forward as examples. You know, what if China, what if, some other um, state engages in behavior, human rights violations alleged or, or verified that, that violates that ESG policy. So concerns around consistency and application policies going forward. And the bottom line is we're, we're seeing a lot of revisiting of ESG. At a much less um, humanitarian crisis level, we also see some clients revisiting their exclusions of the defense sector of natural gas and nuclear securities, both because they now view investment in those as potentially having a public good, and because of the investment case for investing in those as countries such as Germany ramp up their spending on, on military or and defense, or as, as many countries 
look to diversify their energy sources away from a reliance on Russian oil and natural gas. So that's a quick round two of what we see happening with ESG and governance. Guyan, if I could come to you as our head of investment strategy for the Pacific region at Mercer, I'd really love to hear, hear your views on what what the impact has been and, and will be on capital markets and the underlying economy mm -hmm. and, and how clients should address that. Well, th thank you very much, Rich. Um, yes, yeah, so I think it helps to step back a little bit and sort of remember how we got here. Uh, prior to the conflict in the Ukraine, globally, we've been experiencing a pretty robust, re robust recovery from the pandemic, strong but slowing growth and high inflation. Uh, the expectation was that inflation would normalise quite rapidly this year as the impact of the pandemic fiscal, uh, st fiscal stimulus faded and supply chain disruptions resolved themselves, although there was concern about high wage inflation in some markets, particularly the US. Uh, we'd expected central banks to progressively raise interest rates as much as a precautionary measure, i.e. raising rates to give themselves room to cut as a future date as any attempt to slow growth. Now that story has changed a bit, because now we have two new supply shocks that build upon the supply shock of the pandemic itself. Uh, sanctions on Russia and pandemic lockdowns in China. We've also had a shift to a much more hawkish tone from the US Federal Reserve. So the questions the markets are now asking are, how, how big will the supply shock be? How much longer and higher will the inflation spike go on for? How far will interest rates rise? And what is the risk of a recession or some kind of market risk-off event? Um, on the size of the supply shock, this is unknown. So while Russia is a the Russian economy is a small part of global GDP, it does produce the raw inputs for the global economy, food, energy, and minerals, for example. Um, it's also uncertain how strictly the sanctions will be enforced. Um, many countries outside the Western Alliance are. Uh, equivocating on the question of, of enforcing the sanctions, while within the West, it's becoming apparent that in at least some areas, we'll need to see carve-outs on sanctions for key commodities. And this is particularly the case for natural gas in Europe. But the situation is still very fluid. Similarly, we have, with the situation in China, we're not really sure how long or how vigorously the zero COVID policy will be enforced or its impact on production. I'm sure you've seen recently the situation in Shanghai, where you have a whole city essentially on shutdown, and the recent PMI numbers out of China showing the impact on the real economy. So the magnitude of what's coming down the line isn't really known with sufficient certainty, which brings us to the question of the inflation spike. Um, so the markets are in the position of having to guess how big the inflation shock is going to be from these events. Uh, at the moment, inflation break-evens, market expectations for future inflation, are forecasting another leg to the inflation spike that lasts a year or two longer. Uh, however, it's not forecasting a fundamental change in the inflation outlook. So we look at when we look at longer term inflation expectations, such as the US five year, five year forwards, now, I mean, this is a bit of a mouthful, um, that's the market expectation for where the market thinks inflation expectations will be in five years, five years from now. So it's a longer term look. At, um, at where people think inflation is going to be. And that's not really changed since the onset of the crisis. So at the moment, markets are seeing another leg to the inflation shock that came out of the pandemic, but no stagflation. Um, and part of the reason why there's this longer term, you know, comfortable outlook on the inflation environment is that the Federal Reserve has made clear from recent statements that it is on a course to bring inflation under control. Which brings us to the next question of, you know, how far will interest rates rise? And I'll focus on the central on the on the Federal Reserve. Um, at the moment, markets are anticipating um, a rise in the Fed funds rate, the cash rate, to around three percent, i.e., about nine to 10, 25 basis point increases over the next 12 months, with probabilities of cuts thereafter. And again, this is a guess. The market is assuming that the neutral rate for interest rates is around two and a half percent. And the Fed won't have to go much further than that to take the heat out of the economy. But again, we don't know how far central banks will have to go to bring inflation under control. In particular, we don't know if central banks will be able to slow growth enough to moderate inflation in a smooth fashion, or whether it will be necessary deliberately or inadvertently to trigger a recession. Which brings us to sort of the final question that's puzzling markets, and probably the most important one. Um, what is the risk of a recession? Uh, or some kind of market risk-off event. 
Now, I'm sure you've seen commentary in the market about the inversion of the US yield curve. Um, in this case, that's that the, uh, the yield on 10-year bonds is lower than the yield on two-year bonds. Um, this is often an indicator of a recession that is likely to occur in a year or two's time. Um, and all this is really saying is that the market thinks the Federal Reserve will raise rates and then cut rates thereafter. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing expectations that the Federal Reserve will raise rates for a year, then modest cuts thereafter. Um, but by itself, it's not enough to say that a recession is on its way or an equity bear market is imminent, but it is telling us that the risks are rising and it's time to be on watch. So th things I'm looking for, in addition to the yield curve inversion, are how does equity market respond to uh, rises in interest rates? Uh, does, does volatility rise? Does it rally or sell off following an interest rate rise? Um, when the Fed does raise interest rates, uh, what happens to the structure of the yield curve? If as it raises, the whole yield curve goes up, that probably means that it's not caught up with inflation as yet. Whereas if it starts to invert further, that means that we're probably getting to the point where monetary policy is restrictive. Also on macroeconomic variables, um, probably the main one is wage inflation, unemployment, and corporate profits. To bring inflation under the control, the Fed really needs to take the heat out of the US employment market, and recessions are usually preceded by rising unemployment. Also, corporate profitability, earnings growth. Earnings growth is still strong, and that's one cause for optimism in you know, the performance of the equity market over the next year, but earnings revisions are edging down ever so slightly, and revision, recessions are usually preceded by falling earnings and uh, falling profit margins. Uh, so we don't think we don't think a recession is imminent or that we're about to see the onset of a bear market, but probabilities of these risks are rising and we're you know right to be wary. Um, so we do sort of uh, counsel vigilance when uh, when uh, engaging in asset allocation investment decisions. Okay, thank, thank you. Very you. Much, yep. Um, I want to go now to the impact of all that on asset classes. And Shannon, I'm going to start with you. I'll, I'll ask you later about, about local asset classes, but could we start with the emerging markets? There's been a lot of volatility in emerging markets. Guion linked um, the supply shock in Russia to, to supply shocks out of China. Uh, many emerging markets have natural resource dependency. Others are net importers. What are you seeing as you talk to underlying investment managers in terms of risks and opportunities for emerging market equities? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rich. I guess um, through conversations with emerging market managers uh, over the last few weeks and, and sort of year to date, there's three key themes that are, are top of mind. And, you know, China remains the number one area of focus for emerging market managers. Um, that's followed by the inflation and interest rate environment. Uh, which is then followed by the, the Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis and, and the flow-on effects from that. So maybe just walking through each of those in turn. Um, you know, China, we've still got the overhang of the regulatory um, crackdown that, that came in last year where we saw the tech companies and the education sector help, sell off uh, quite heavily. It's, it's become more benign now, but it's more about uncertainty in terms of the direction of travel that that's going to take. In fact, it's, you know, we, we've actually seen potentially some positive regulatory reforms more recently. So that might be more supportive for the Chinese economy going forward. But it's pretty early days, I guess, in terms of coming to that conclusion. Uh, the next one really is, is that COVID zero policy. Um, you know, the, the crackdowns, they're impacting on growth, they're impact, impacting on supply chains in China and, and more broadly those surrounding countries as well and, and, and the globe. Um, but the question is, how, how much is that priced in? So, you know, managers are questioning whether it's sort of still worst case scenario and any shift away from that zero policy or COVID zero policy might be seen as, as a positive and we might get a bit of a bounce um, there. And you're hearing murmurs on the ground that they're subtly testing the waters on, on uh, easing, easing that policy for, um, for, for their economy. And then you've got, um, I guess, the other positive for China is they, they, they're actually going into an easing cycle, a supportive cycle for growth when the rest of the world's tightening. Um, so that should help companies in China as well. And then lastly, I think, is the, the valuations that have come out of this regulatory, regulatory crackdown. Uh, the China offshore market in particular got hit pretty hard. We're now probably, probably seeing a pretty good entry point or, or managers are seeing this as a good entry point. And a really good example, I was talking with an Asian uh, 
equity manager yesterday and they, they were, you know, they brought up Alibaba's trading on 10 times earnings um, and, and it's still a quality company. Yes, there's a few headwinds, but um, that just shows you it's showing up in value manager uh, portfolios now at current rates. It used to be a growth growth uh, stock. So that's China. Inflation and interest rates, again, it's coming through energy and, and commodities. Um, you know, managers are, are pretty focused on both in, in their portfolios and the opportunity set, who's got the pricing power. So who can pass that, that cost down the supply chain? Who can pass it on to, to, uh, to the end user, basically? And, and those companies are going to be in a much stronger position. Uh, and then I think maybe the other thing to, to pick up on the interest rate environment is, you know, these markets are much stronger than they've been in the past. So in past crises, they haven't had the balance sheet quality that they've got today. Um, they haven't had the foreign reserves and, and you know, more independence in terms of uh, driving their own destiny. So that, that's a positive. And then lastly, maybe directly to the Russian crisis, you know, the, the direct impacts here are, are very small. Russia's a very small part of the global economy. It's no bigger than the Italian economy. But the indirect impacts are significant. You know, where's inflation going to pop up across supply chains? Where are those you know, they talk about like neon gases essential in uh, the semiconductor process uh, and, and Russia supplies a big portion of that. But, you know, which companies have set themselves up, which companies haven't and, and distinguishing there. Um, so inflationary pressures and uncertainty are two other ones. And then, uh, you know, maybe contagion effect into some European countries. So there's, I've had a few conversations around Polish opportunities in Poland. You know, on one side, managers are saying we, we can't go anywhere near this. We can't price the risk um, given the, 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 the conflicts ongoing. Other managers are seeing opportunities there with Polish banks selling off very heavily and probably too far. And um, with the net migration that you've seen into that country, you know, that's potentially a support for growth sort of two years out. So maybe you're getting set in some good good positions now for, for um, I guess, a future recovery. So those are sort of main things and maybe maybe the other one is the russia short trade sorry so what russia produces who else in emerging markets produces those things um because they're, they're set to benefit from the increase in in demand okay thanks shannon i want to come back to you later also and ask about value versus growth and its interplay with inflation and energy prices um but first sue let's go to the bond side we've had past crises in the emerging market debt and suddenly we have a a prospect of potential sovereign default by russia with lots of contagion across the emerging debt markets. You know, Shannon quickly sp spun to a buying opportunity. W what are your views on the impacts on the emerging market debt from this crisis? And are, are you and your clients worried or are you, um, are you seeing a buying opportunity? Worried or buying opportunity? Probably a bit of both, Rich. Um, but if we take a step back, the asset class has clearly struggled in the last couple of months. It is important to note that um, Russia was a part of both the hard currency and the local currency sovereign indices. Um, and its weight at the start of this year was 3% um, in hard currency and about 7% in, in local currency. But in terms of a, a performance perspective, at the, the very start of the year, way before the conflict even began, the expectations of rising rates and inflationary pressure was already having an impact on the more duration heavy hard currency portion of, of the market and, and that um, that index actually delivered a negative three percent return in, in January whereas local currency we saw started the year really quite positively um, and was up three percent um, in January mostly due to expectations that EM um, would likely do well from rising commodity prices you sort of fast forward to the second half of February and, and the Russia invasion into Ukraine clearly led to large performance drawdowns across a variety of emerging market indices. To put it in perspective, hard currency was down 6.4% in February and local currency was down a whopping 7.8%. And then in mid-March, you had JP Morgan come out and say they were taking Russia out of all their fixed income indices at the end of the month, which, which put further pressure on the asset class. And we saw both hard currency and local currency down for the month of March again. And you're put, putting all of that together, what you've got in the first quarter of 2022 is hard currency down almost 10% and local currency down about nine and a half. So really, really large moves, very, very volatile markets. So where we are right now is that Russian high currency bonds are tradable and we are seeing some price discovery in the markets, but the local currency bonds are virtually not tradable and the prices are very, very close to zero. Depending on how the situation pans out in Europe, 
we think there is upside potential in these assets. And if and when normal trading conditions um, resume, we will be probably looking to capitalise on that. Um, as you can expect, Rich, it, it's, a, it's a situation we're monitoring really, really closely and we are trying to keep clients you know, abreast of, of developments in the space. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to come back to equities and fixed income in a minute, but uh, I, I want to turn to private markets now and, and I, I'm kind of... Um, you're going a bit out of order here, but I, I'd like to get Raylan in. Raylan, how should investors be considering private market investment right now, diversification opportunities, and and what's your view on being nimble versus prescriptive? So, so how, how should investors vary from their target, you know, the targets they may have in mind a few months ago, if at all? Should they should they be responsive to short term changes, or should they? just stick with their long-term plan. Can't they be both? I mean, I think the beauty of private markets is it's not a binary exercise, right? I mean, investors can be both prescriptive and nimble because one, there's a diverse universe of managers that are able to meet investors' prescriptive investment objectives, but also managers can be nimble, right? They can deploy capital over a long time period so they can see how the implications of events such as the current one play out and utilize their value add capabilities. I would say, you know, in terms of, it was interesting to, just to hear the comments from the other, um, our other colleagues that, you know, posturing over the short term, which again is a bit anathema to, to private markets, which are much more long-term focused. But I would say that inflation protection is, is important. And one way to approach this is through asset-based, asset -based, excuse me, financing opportunities. Um, you know, strategies that ultimately consider the eventual transition to a lower carbon economy, such as mining of precious metals and materials. And you've heard Shannon and others just speak to the volatility, which in private markets, we love volatility. And while this may sound controversial, when you think about the energy transition, it's inflationary as you move toward renewables. There's a lack of investment in the old economy of energy, which still powers 83% of the global electricity. So all of this compounded with the ongoing conflict in Ukraine and Russia is just continuing to exacerbate prices. And the higher cost of oil right now certainly appears to make renewables more competitive, yet scalability still, it's gonna take time. So you could consider, and again, this might be a bit controversial, but mining private finance opportunities could be a favorable strategy as you look over the two to three year to five year investment time horizon to capture disruption in global commodities. Um, and I think as you hit a step function in energy prices, again, you're going to see that pricing power is staying power. Um, and we've seen several decades of supply chain management Across private markets managers, they possess expertise to manage global business supply chains. And certainly products that are essential goods that are heavily branded that the Gen Zs and millennials want that have complex supply chains, those private markets managers are going to be able to adjust and position for the long term and short term. Shannon, Raylan mentioned natural resources, and, and she also doubled down on your mention of pricing power. Could you talk a bit about what you're seeing locally in the Australian and New Zealand equity markets in terms of opportunities and threats and how, how managers and clients are addressing those? Yeah, sure. Um, I think maybe maybe to touch on New Zealand first, and maybe direct impact on both of our economies is, um, is, is small um, or, or, or non-existent, I guess, in terms of the flow and effect from commodities to Australia. But for New Zealand first, the real challenge over there is the inflationary pressures that they're under. So they're, they're facing 30-year highs in inflation and a really um, a, a really aggressive rate hike cycle at the moment, um, which, is, which is priced into markets over there. And it's a pretty interest rate sensitive market as well. So that, that poses a bit of a challenge. You know, the one positive to that might be that a lot of this is already priced in, as I say, and that we might see a bit of a backtrack, which could be positive for the New Zealand market. Uh, but it does come in on, on pretty high valuations, given the, the, the strong performance that New Zealand's seen over the, over the last sort of five-year period, X, X last year. So for New Zealand, not, not 
too much to comment on there in terms of impacts from Russia. But for Australia, you know, I think in 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 contrast to the last five years where our market structure has really been a disadvantage to us, you know, what, the world's been led by those mega cap growth names. We don't have those strong leaders in the technology space. Um, you know, looking forward, what we've got is we've got banks and we've got materials companies. Now, the banks should do pretty well, all else equal, in a rising rate environment. Um, it strengthen, strengthens their NIMS or their, or their, their margins on their, on their products. Um, there is increasing competition locally, but that, that's more of a local issue than, than global. Um, and so banks should be okay. In terms of the materials sector, though, you know, I guess picking up on what Raylan's talking about there, we've got in the ground what the whole world wants and needs, right? So we've got, we've got ore, we've got copper, we've got lithium, um, nickel, rare earths. Those are all essential ingredients or raw ingredients that feed into, um, I guess, global growth, but, but in particular, the decarbonisation um, thematic that's, you know, it's a $4 trillion requir investment requirement to, to meet the world's needs over the coming years. And so that's going to put us in a really strong position. And I think a continued strong position in terms of that demand. And if you think about, you know, what's happening there, I think it's only going to speed up. So the European countries, I mean, you might have seen Germany's commitment in terms of renewables. There's, there's, there's the decarbonisation, but there's also energy independence requirements in Europe. So Germany's just brought forward their goal of being 100% renewable by 2035. Now, that, that, I'd call that a stretch goal. Um, that might be a tough one to achieve, but it really is going to require a lot of, uh, what, a lot of what the Australian economy's got to offer. You mentioned that Russia short trade earlier, looking at, at economies and, and companies that benefit from Russia being excluded from the global economy. Is Australia in that category for you to some extent? De yeah, definitely. definitely. Okay, interesting. Um, Sue, we've had mentions of interest rates and inflation and uh, balance sheets and Forex. The bond market's beyond emerging markets. How, how should investors be positioning their bond portfolios to navigate the battle between inflation and, and the monetary authorities? Oh, it's been a very rough ride so far this year, Rich. Um, some are calling it the potential end to the 40-year bond bull market, but, but others say it's way too early to make that call. But something most people seem to be able to agree on is that we're definitely seeing a regime shift, which naturally brings with it volatility. And just to put into context how much bond markets have moved since the start of this year, the US 10-year bond yields up over 1% and is around 26 now. These are levels last seen in 2019. And Australia's followed a very similar path. 10-year bond yields also up more than 1%, nearing 3%. And that's a level we haven't seen since 2015. And credit markets have had the double whammy of rising government bond yields, but also widening spreads. And like other risk assets, um, credit suffered from the risk off sentiment earlier this year and was further spooked by the crisis in Europe. We've seen things settle down um, in the last couple of weeks. Spreads have narrowed in, but they remain wider than they were at the start of the year. And when you put those two pieces together, what you got was a Bloomberg Barclays Global Aggregate Index recording its worst ever rolling one year return in history. That happened on the 23rd of March. It was negative 7.3%. We've seen some retracement from that um, by the end of March, and we're down looking like 6.5 um, in the year to the end of March. But with all that in mind, how should investors really be positioning the portfolio and, and what are we doing um, within the MRSA funds? And um, first and foremost, in volatile and uncertain times, we think staying flexible and liquid is key. We think there's value in keeping some risk budget and some dry powder to, uh, to respond to, to events and potentially take advantage of, of opportunities. On the duration front, we continue to prefer a modest underweight, you know, given the, the up, potential uplift in inflation risk and the prospects, increasing prospects, I would add, that central banks prioritise fighting inflation over growth. And having said that, um, we, we think that the Australian 10-year yield, which I mentioned earlier, is creeping up towards 3% is probably not far off fair value. And so this may not be a bad point um, to add a little bit of duration back into your portfolios.
In terms of um, uh, credit, spread assets have clearly sold off um, you know, across the board um, and they're representing slightly better value a a as we speak. The credit markets are subject to further weakness if the Russia-Ukraine um, situation escalates and, and indeed if central banks are, are, are more hawkish in needing to address inflation, that could also hurt, hurt credit. But with these improved valuations, we are looking opportunistically in our, in our funds to increase risk. Um, we have a very strong focus on liquid and resilient sectors and exposures, though. Um, but overall, um, we think it's never been a more important time to be sort of nimble and active in your um, fixed income portfolios. In terms of manual selection, that naturally lends itself um, with, with regards to a shift from beta to focusing on alpha and, and look seeking managers that are going to um, you know, navigate the situation better and look to take advantage of, of more volatile and divergent markets. Okay, thanks, Sue. Um, Raylan, we've had one uh, house come out, their CEO um, indicating that Russia's invasion in Ukraine marks the end of globalization. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what are your views on that? What's the impact of this crisis these these tragic events on on globalization. Well, Rich, I would purport it's absolutely not the end of globalization. It's a another step in the evolution of how we operate as a global economy. I mean, you think about since the 2008 crisis, there's been a steady decline in globalization, defined as really cross you know border transfer of physical goods. As a percentage of GDP, it just, it's declined from 27% in 08 to 19% in 2001. Yet during this time, when globalization has theoretically been in decline, private markets asset classes has, have continued to outperform. Fundraising is like $1.2 trillion, 20% increase just since 2020. And when you look at returns, they've continued to outperform public markets, no offense to my colleagues. Um, and you see since 2008, private equity alone, the top quartile of managers have generated a 20% net IRR. But I think we need, honestly, it's, we talk about globalization, the context of commodities, of, of merchandise, of physical goods being transferred, but we can't forget something that I sort of alluded to earlier, that globalization is irreversible because of data flows. And when you think about this, uh, and Rich, I know you like to sometimes binge watch Netflix shows. Um, by 2022, global data flows are expected to reach 150,000 gigabytes per second. That is the equivalent of 325 million households watching Netflix 24 seven. And when you think about that, you know, go back to 1992, global data flows were 100, gigabytes a day, that's like 10 households watching Netflix for 10 hours. So when you think about, you may not connect the dots, but data flows are a huge aspect of globalization. And when you think about some of the emerging trends within private markets, 73% of Gen Z, they own stocks and they make, these are the most common investments. They're doing it through digital exchanges. And you think about what's happening in private markets with tokenization where Effectively, you can make previously inaccessible private markets investments accessible to retail investors. That has a huge, um, a huge impact. So, I mean, you think about just all the impacts of the digitization of our global economy has and themes that our manager focused on cybersecurity, the energy transition, smart technology, brand relevance. Um, and just that ability to command pricing power. So I, I would say that we've entered an era where data is the new shipping container, right? And private markets are not bystanders of what's happening. They are the accelerants. Okay, thanks for that, Raylan. Um, we've got some questions from the audience and, and one that, that struck me as a reminder to me to come back to Shannon to ask about value growth. So, uh, Shannon, value had had a tough time for a while, and uh, to the point where clients were asking us, "Does value still make sense?" Um, what What's your view, not just on the recent comeback, but but how should clients position going forward? And and is value growth still the most useful paradigm, or a useful paradigm, or how how would you advise clients to go about portfolio positioning, portfolio construction, and going forward? 
Yeah, I, I'd say certainly the, the medium to long term is definitely a, a, a more supportive environment for value. As you say, it's, it's, it's a decade where it just hasn't delivered. And for the last five years, value managers jumping up and down saying there's great opportunities over here, but nobody was really focused on it. So I think the sentiment has shifted in that direction. These companies are getting more attention now uh, because of what's been going on more recently and, and rising rates, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen a 13% outperformance of value versus growth just from December to the end of Q1. So in the MSCI world indices. So that, that's, that's pretty huge outperformance from one side of the market over the other. But despite that, that margin uh, in terms of the spread between uh, valuations in value versus growth, it's still extraordinarily large and, and there is definitely room for that to, to continue on. I think if, it, if it's going to, though, it's probably got to be a bit more broad-based than it's been to date. You know, it's really been a deep value rally over this recent period. It's been energy that's sort of driven those returns, you know, 50% outperformance relative to the market over, over a six-month period. So, um, you know, any, any upside surprises to interest rates will continue to push the value side as well. Um, but, it, but I think from instead of saying shifting it all the way to value, as it's going to be a value market going forward, it's more that I think it's going to be a more balanced market going forward. So there's opportunities on both sides of the ledger. Um, you know, as soon as the focus on fundamentals returns, for example, you know, it's been a macro driven market. As soon as investors turn their mind to, to what companies are delivering, they're going to be looking for earnings growth uh, once again. And so, you know, those, those multiples that have come down quite harshly and pretty much across the board, you know, active management's going to be more discerning about, you know, which companies are trading at better valuations. There's going to be more discipline around valuations for sure across the board. Um, but if, if you think about the role of value and growth, value really does well because of interest rates rising in response to inflation. But earnings growth, I think, is just is the best hedge when it comes to an inflation hedge. You want your earnings growing faster than inflation so that you are growing in, in real terms. And so it's that's that's more on that sort of quality growth or reasonable price, I guess. So it's about having that balance across the portfolio. And it, it sort of speaks to quality throughout the portfolio as well, right? Whether you're talking about value companies or growth companies, you want strong balance sheets. I think we've said nimble twice already on the call. So let's say proactive rather than reactive. Um, companies, you want good management teams so they can make good capital allocation decisions and, and you want good earnings growth as well. So I think quality is key throughout your portfolio. Um, I think diversification is going to be really important um, relative to what it's been in the past because you get these spikes in certain parts of the market and if you're not exposed to them, it, it, it does sort of, uh, it does hurt whether it's um, when it's on the upside. So um, so two, two points on this, active management I think is going to be well placed going forward and uh, and and be diversified a, a across the the spectrum from from growth to value, but make sure you've got quality in there. I think. Okay, thanks. I'm going to flag. I hear Mercer's consulting culture coming through. I think that's the third or fourth time <laughs> I've tried to set you guys up with a hard choice, and you you told me both. But I I do I do agree with you on um, you know diversification and 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 uh, and and nimbleness and and the scope for active management. Um, Guion, I, I think one of our audience wants more macro and, and specifically has asked about emergent and important trends and opportunities going forward. So as you look forward, mm. you know, we've got the current crisis, which you spoke to, and current dynamics globally. Mm. But where do you see the opportunities over the next three, five years? What, what trends should investors be looking to make sure feature in their portfolios? Yeah, this is, this is a very interesting topic. A very engaging question. I think I think that pretty much all the speakers so far have touched on it with some degree or or another. Um, so there is a potential for very profound consequences coming out of the um, the conflict in Ukraine, although it's still early days, and we have to strike a balance between being you know, um, too speculative, um, but also trying to identify these emerging trends. So I, I might just focus on, on on two themes that existed prior to the to the Ukraine crisis, but may have been accelerated by it. Um, and this is going back to some of the comments that Raylan um, spoke about earlier. I think we're likely to see um, uh, an acceleration in the rise of a multipolar world and regionalization, but also a changing monetary environment. So on, on the question of the, the multipolar world, um, I think this is really just a, a the symbolic movement away from that post-Cold War 
unipolar world to, to a world in which there are a, a multiple centers of power. And this has really been made possible by the economic rise of China. It doesn't mean an end to globalization, but it does mean that we're likely to see changes in its character. Um, we'd like to see uh, rerouting of supply chains to focus on things like increased diversification and robustness. And that will lead to uh, investment opportunities in both public and private markets. And on the issue of the um, changing monetary environment, well, the monetary environment is always evolving, although it normally occurs over time scales of decades rather than years. So we've seen, as it were, the, the rise and fall of the gold standard, uh, the rise and fall of the sterling block. Um, we live under the dominance of, you know, the petrodollar regime. Um, one of the things that we've seen most interestingly coming out of, um, out of the Ukraine crisis is what you could call the, the weaponization of the payment system and central bank reserves as a tool of, uh, of foreign policy. Um, we've also seen Russia reacting to try and move to a more commodity-based currency, um, pegging to gold and trying to um, uh, demand payment for its gas in rubles rather than dollars or euros. Meanwhile, in the background, we have the slow movement towards central bank digital currencies. And this is a very interesting trend. Um, this adds a whole new dimension to the potentials of monetary policy, um, but it does start to blur the line between um, fiscal and monetary policy and places central banks in a, in a, as effectively being legislative powers that are normally reserved to parliament. So it's that intersection of the kind of um, uh, just regulating monetary affairs with the broader ESG kind of considerations become within, you know, within remit under a, a, a digital currency environment. Um, so we're looking, we're living through times of enormous change, and how it's going to play out is far from certain. Um, my advice at the moment is to, you know, um, be open-minded about the potential for change, but be quite conservative and cautious in responding to these changes. Um, because it's not clear as yet the pace and extent to which things will play out. So, uh, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got a question, and I'm going to read it. I'm I'm not going to name names. So, if 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 anybody has a question, you haven't asked it because you're worried I'm going to name you. That that's not I should have mentioned. This is the ground rules are I'm giving the questions without naming names. In this case, the the questioner starts off by saying, "I am an ESG skeptic." So that's a pretty provocative statement. Um, hasn't the crisis led to outperformance for mainstream investment strategies versus sustainable investment strategies? What does this mean for ESG going forward? I'm assuming I'm going to uh, team. I'm going to start off with this, and then if you guys want to comment, please please uh, raise your hand or something. I'll get you in. I'm assuming that what the questioner is referencing is that strategies that were underweight the traditional energy sector have probably underperformed in the last few months because oil prices have gone to 103 or $110 a barrel. So in terms of relative returns, if you're benchmarked against a traditional market index in the short term, I, I think the questioner is probably right that, that some sustainable strategies will have underperformed versus benchmark. The other aspect of it, though, is that a lot of our ESG-focused clients, particularly on climate, are very focused on investing in clean tech and green tech in the private market space. They're deliberately investing in technologies and ventures that are trying to reduce the cost of renewables in hopes of um, making the transition economically viable for more of the world economy and, and really having the transition to lower carbon be self-financing in the sense that, that the technologies become cheaper than, than traditional energy, or at least competitive. And all of those investments, the absolute returns on those investments just went up or their prospect for a good absolute return went up. So fund one, fund two, fund one, three, you know, green tech, clean tech is now competing with oil at 103, $105 a barrel instead of oil at 50 or $70 a barrel. That gives the underlying ventures more time to get to proof of revenue, to get to proof of NOI. It gives them higher earnings. They may still have underperformed the share price of a traditional energy company in the most recent three months. But private market investors focus on their IRR. They focus on the absolute return. So I actually think I actually think that um, even the short-term impact of the crisis is going to cause our ESG-focused clients to to double down because their recent returns in private markets will be very strong. And then as we look forward, the you know government after government is talking about becoming less reliant on totalitarian regimes for energy. You know more energy independent and. Renewables tend to be domestically produced. Uh, 
and within the control of the local economy and government. So renewable energy is seen as a big part of the answer to energy independence. So I actually think we're gonna see a lot of government infrastructure spending on trying to migrate power grids, install mass battery storage, other things that are all very ESG friendly. And so investors that have already put their money in the ground, already already put their money into, into private markets or public markets will benefit from that coming wave of spending even as the traditional energy sector may also attract more investment in the next couple of years than it would have with a lower, lower oil price. I, this is all still being sorted through and team, you can feel free to disagree with my views on it if you think I've missed something or if you heard something smart from a manager that you wanna pass on. Any, any reactions to my swing at that particular? Um, and I appreciate the questioner. I, I, you know, we, we, we like provocative questions, so I hope we'll get more of those. Team, anything you wanna add? Uh, I just say I, I think I, I agree with what you said there, Rich. I, I, you know, the majority of um, sustainability-focused strategies. You're right; they have no traditional oil. A lot of traditional funds also uh, are pretty underweight because it's sort of a sunset industry and it doesn't have great long-term uh, expectations for it. So, but the other thing that I'd add is just it has been a tough time. In addition, because a lot of those opportunities have been in Europe and. Um, you know, as a bit of a byproduct of what's happened here, Europe's been under a lot more pressure recently. So they've had that sort of double whammy effect in terms of the returns to date, um, typically underweight the US, which is a safe haven people have flocked back to um, during this time. But um, I, I agree that that speeding up in terms of energy independence in, in Europe might be a pretty strong trend going forward and uh, it's more competitive at these prices. Okay. Um Gwen, we've got another question that I think is aimed at you. Um, it doesn't start off as provocatively. It says, due to international challenges such as China with COVID and the Ukraine, should there be more emphasis and investment be placed on sovereign capacity and capabilities in countries such as Australia that rely heavily on mining and agriculture? Well, I think I think that there, there are sort of two two things there. One says, well, what is the what is the degree of state agency? So obviously, some governments are more effective at getting things done than others. Um, and then there's the underlying resources of of the country and its ability to respond to changing circumstances. So Australia has a um, a high agency government, but a limited government. And to contrast that with say China, which has a high agency government, but unlimited in its bounds of action. The difference between those two things is Australia is likely to have a more diverse approach moving forward. So private sector will pursue multiple paths. In China, we've been seeing this situation, you know, last year we had um, sudden reductions in coal consumption and then a reversal in policy. And likewise, at the moment, we're seeing uh, big COVID lockdowns and presumably at some point that will be reversed. And that's a, a reflection of that very... Um, uh, centred decision-making process rather than a more diverse decision-making process. So I think that needs to be taken to, into account. And then you have the, um, the different economic profiles involved. So Australia is, um, uh, in terms of your core real economy, is very much a, a commodity producer. China is a commodity consumer. Um, and that will um, that will impact the ability of the um, of the various economies both to, to grow and attract investment. And I think it's worth drawing back to the plate earlier that as we transition the economy from um, a fossil fuel to a more renewables economy, we're going to have to support these big levels of, of investment, um, as it were, the, um, the rebuilding of our energy infrastructure. And that's going to be uh, more favourable for commodity producers, at least for the time being, than commodity consumers. Um, I hope I'm not sure if that directly answers the question, but I think it sort of skirts around it in, a, in an appropriate way. Okay, I, I'd invite the questioner to ask a follow up if um, if if we didn't get it head on, but I, I, I thought the answer was responsive. Um, next question: Some commentators are suggesting that following and team, I'll probably take the first swing at this and then invite you guys in. Some commentators are suggesting that following emerging evidence of atrocities, a full energy ban on Russia is now unstoppable. How would this change perceptions of the potential future scenario and what implications for portfolio positioning? I, I share the questioner's premise as regards Western European democracies and the existing um, global coalition that's already sanctioned Russia. I am skeptical, however, that um, countries such as China or India 
that have not participated fully in the global sanctions um, and other countries that didn't vote for censure in the UN, even with the more recent evidence of, of worse atrocities than I think we imagined had happened, may 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 continue to buy Russian oil. I, I you know don't know that, but it, there may still be a market. But I think for Western Europe, I, I guess Guyana it probably goes to you. But I, I would think it's more of the same. It's a, it's a a, a partial um, discouragement of using Russian energy creates a stagflationary shock. An outright mm. ban would create a bigger stagflationary shock, and Europe would have to get its energy from elsewhere. Mm. If the Russian oil and natural gas finds a market somewhere in the world, then global supply is less impacted than if it doesn't. Mm. But do you, do you see more than that? Is it more of the same? Is it is it qualitatively different or just just a difference in degree? Oh, I think I think as it were, immediately turning off energy supplies from Russia um, is um, is probably at the limits of the possible for, um, for for Europe. But that being said, this this idea that we're going to start rebuilding global supply chains to reflect you know national security issues, um, robustness, and so forth that falls into that category. We're likely to see that um, that uh, Europe will transition away from Russia as a source of energy over time, but not straight away, even though, you know, I think we obviously all feel a degree of horror and moral outrage at what we've seen happening in the Ukraine. Um, in terms of, in terms of um, uh, whether just turning it off uh, would cause a, obviously that's a big hit to supply, but it also would be a threat to the, to, the, to the European financial system as well, and that's potentially a deflationary impact. Um, I think that there's going to be this is going to be a multi-year process of, of essentially phasing Russia out of its interface with the Western economies. Okay. I'm going to try to fit in one more question before we run out of time. And the question is, recent inflation driven by fuel and food, is it demand dampening, crushing discretionary spending, or a precursor to offsetting wage increases driving all prices up, a late 70s wage price file horrible for all assets? I, I'll take the first swing at this, and and Guyan, feel free to disagree with me or others. I I think the um, our our global economy, our society is betting on the rational expectations hypothesis, and that by signaling, by having monetary authorities signal, we'll do what it takes to rein in inflation, and then engage in some initial credible actions around curtailing quantitative easing, moving to quantitative tightening. Um, doing some interest rate increases, they're signaling we, we do what it takes and therefore trying to get sentiment to do the rest. Expectations that inflation is going to go down causes people not to try to get the price increase, maybe not try to get the wage increase, and that that's different from the 1970s when central banks didn't have the authority or the demonstrated competence or you know, just just the the social media currency that they have today, where their actions are front page news for everybody and move markets immediately. So um, my career goes way back. It doesn't quite go back to the late seventies. I lived through them, but not as an investment consultant. So, but I, I do think there were some other dynamics there in terms of the creation of OPEC. Um, you know, cartelization, basically price fixing for the energy market. A, a significant war on with with f associated fiscal stimulus, so um, you know a bit some different dynamics today. But I think the big difference is is this bet we're all making. You know, we're not we're not pricing in that the that the monetary authorities are going to have to put our economies into a massive recession, take unemployment back up into double digits to get inflation under control, in the way that Volcker did in the early '80s in the U.S. We're we're imagining that by threatening to do what it takes. The monetary authorities can rein in inflation. Guion or anybody, do you do you disagree with that thesis? I think that's pretty much spot on. It is a different circumstances from, from, from the 1970s, which is not to diminish the um, the, the validity of, of, of you know worrying about stagflation, but that commitment from the Fed to bring inflation under control is a big part of it, going back to Richard's comments about managing expectations. Um, and also, and I think I think the um, uh, alluding to the, to the, the question um, that the um, uh, uh, inflation has, on average, been rising faster than wages. So um, disposable income, real spending capacity has been, you know, if not falling, then at least capped out. 
And that limits the ability for this to turn into a wage price spiral. And I think probably makes it easier for central banks to bring inflation under control with hopefully only moderate interest rate rises. But that being said, as I, I said during my, my initial introduction, we don't know the magnitude of the um, supply shock as yet, or the degree of you know, effective demand destruction that will need to be accompanied in order to bring inflation under control. But um, I think it will be easier um, than we experienced in the 1970s, where the central banks were very much behind the curve. They were more prone to interference from, um, from governments. You know, we know the story of Arthur Burns and essentially the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK would be on the phone to the Bank of England setting monetary policy. Interest rates were set in cabinet meetings. We're a long way from that now. So hopefully it'll be less of a much less of a traumatic experience than the 1970s were. Okay, I hope so too, because otherwise we're in for some <laughs> some big volatility out there. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I, I want to thank our audience for for your active participation and hope you will stick around for our, our post event survey and give us some some feedback. Thank you all. <laughs>